Olá, boa tarde. Bem-vindos a esta uh, mesa 6 do Fólio Autores. Uh, como o Pedro disse, vamos falar de, de cotidiano, dessa palavra, na próxima, perto de uma hora, com uma parte final para perguntas do vosso lado, se as houver. Uh, cotidiano é a palavrinha que nos cabe uh, dissecar agora nesta conversa com estas duas autoras e vamos ver como é que ela bate certo ou não com a outra palavra que serve de... Uh, a outra palavra que serve de tema chapéu ao fólio deste ano, a inquietação. Uh, vou só fazer uma explicação rápida sobre a mecânica linguística disto, para quem não está familiarizado. Idealmente, vamos entender-nos nas línguas em que cada um preferir. Uh, eu vou falar em português, a Dânia falará em inglês, a Beatriz Serrano na língua que entender, <risos> ou português ou castelhano. Há tradução simultânea para quem quiser requisitar os seus auriculares. E, portanto, vamos avançar. Eu sou a Mariana Oliveira, vou fazer uma breve apresentação uh, destas duas autoras que têm para já em comum o facto de terem sido publicadas uh, em Portugal pela primeira vez este ano. São duas edições muito recentes destes dois livros, já vamos falar deles, estão também ali para quem, para quem depois uh, tiver interesse. Um, a Dânia Kukavka vem dos, uh, dos Estados Unidos, está pela primeira vez em Portugal, estava agora a dizer-me, uh, publicou até ao momento dois livros de, de grande circulação global, primeiro Girl in Snow, em 2017, uh, que não está publicado em Portugal, e depois este que aqui tenho, Notas sobre, sobre uma Execução, esse sim, já disponível uh, em português desde mais ou menos princípios deste ano. É um thriller uh, que começa por nos apresentar um homem uh, no Corredor da Morte, um assassino em série que está a poucas horas... Uh, a poucas horas da execução para depois, na verdade, se centrar o livro na, na vida, de, 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 sobretudo de três mulheres cuja vida se entrelaça com a desse homem e nos ajuda a explicar e a perceber a vida desse condenado já vamos falar do livro além da escrita, a Dânia tem também um, um, um cotidiano como agente literária a Beatriz Serrano é de Madrid um bocadinho mais perto uh, acaba de sair cá o Desencanto, o livro que tenho, que tenho aqui à frente, que é também o romance de estreia da Beatriz, e acaba mesmo, mesmo de sair, acho que tem pouquíssimos dias nas, nas livrarias. Um, vou só dizer que o livro tem uma, 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 uma breve dedicatória, dedicada aos pais e também, abre aspas, a todas as pessoas que acordam todos os dias sem vontade de ir trabalhar. Uh, acho que é uma pista importante, é uma pista certeira para nos fazer perceber o que o livro é. A protagonista é uma jovem uh, millennial a trabalhar numa agência de publicidade, uh, a odiar o que faz, a odiar secretamente as pessoas com quem trabalha. É também um produto do seu tempo, ela, viciada em YouTube, em vídeos de YouTube e em medicação para a ansiedade. Um, além da escrita, a Beatriz tem um cotidiano como jornalista. Um, acabaram de se conhecer, não foi no fólio, a Beatriz e a Dânia, não se... As vossas vidas nunca se tinham cruzado. Acabaram de, de se cruzar aqui neste, nesta edição do Fólio. E vamos tentar uma espécie de cruzamento entre estes dois livros, que são, de facto, de universos bastante, bastante diferentes. Mas, para começar, gostava de vos pedir que respondessem, da forma que entendessem, ao, 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 ao mote principal desta edição do Fólio, que é inquietação. O que é que mais vos inquieta neste momento? Nos vossos países, nas vossas vidas... Uh, na vossa literatura, qual é a vossa maior inquietação? Dânia, queres começar? <laughs> Bem-vinda. Oh, that is such a great question. Um, and I hope everyone can understand me in English. I think there's um, translation available if yes. you need. Um, what disquiets me most? Well, within my genre, um, I write mostly crime fiction. And um, in my genre, what disquiets me most is men. Um, they, I, I think what I write about and what I think about a lot is um, the violence against women that happens in everyday life, um, everyday circumstances, and how that violence often becomes sensationalized. And that's what both of my books are about, are the idea um, that crime sort of tells a story within a story, right? It tells the story of what actually happened, and then it tells the story of the real people who experience that. So I think what disquiets me about that, and the reason that I think about it so often often is because American culture, specifically, um, really contends with the concept of crime and true crime in a very sensationalist way. We love it, and I have no idea why we love it, and it 
it really makes me anxious that we love it so much and I'm always digging into why. So that's sort of the artistic answer, I guess. And then, you know, there's the world at large. A different answer. <laughs> so, yeah. E os livros, uh, a literatura serve-te para resolver essa inquietação? Ou dar alguma forma que se possa partilhar com, com outros? Yes, I think it allows me to ask the questions that I don't know how to ask in daily life. It allows me to, um, to really investigate a lot of those questions in a way that I can't in my actual life, which is not affected by these things. I think I sort of consume them in the media as everyone else does and have these questions and thoughts that I'm able to ask on the page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beatrice, mm -hmm. uh, o que é que te inquieta? <laughs> to me, um, I'm getting this question a lot in this festival, probably because of the topic of it. And my answer is always that I'm very worried about the future because we are in a time and place now that I don't know for sure what will be happen. And this is the first time in my life I got this feeling so much. Like if you talk about politics or you talk about war or you talk like I, can even tell how many times in this festival we talk about Trump or we talk about Israel and Palestine or we talk about so many things that they are going on. But also, we talk a lot, a lot about daily life and about how is this affecting us. Like, for example, here in Portugal, there is a big problem with rent that is the same thing that is going on in Spain. And I was just like coming here and talking about, I don't know how I'm going, how is going to be life in, ter in 10 years or something, because I can imagine that this situation is going to be solved somehow. So I will say future, because it's the first time in my life that I have no answers to it, and I just can wonder and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. Vamos à outra palavra, o quotidiano, daily life. Um, gostava de perceber se o vosso quotidiano tem alguma coisa a ver com a vossa escrita. Uh, ou seja, se, se, é um, se, 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 se parte dele ou se a escrita e a literatura são justamente o contrário, ou seja, uma forma de, de evasão do quotidiano. Uh, Dania. You know, I think every writers daily life their their fiction lives inside their daily life right i almost picture it like it's like a little garden that's living in me somewhere right um i think i carry it around everywhere that i go if that makes sense i don't think that i have a daily life that has anything to do with serial killers in case you were all concerned about that um <laughs> so no i don't and i also don't have any particularly traumatic past um and you know i was just talking to beatrice last night actually about um you know how our families read our books and and how my parents are often asked like oh what happened to her yeah. as a child why is she like this like what did you do um Mine thinks i have depression or something yeah after yeah after reading my book exactly yeah. they're like why are you why are you so dark why are you so sad when in like actual life I'm really not it's just sort of this inner world that you create right to get out maybe I wouldn't even call them the demons I think they're just the questions um I don't know I hope I hope that answers your question uh -huh. mm -hmm. Beatrice yeah it's, it's, it's funny how to say about escapism I think we use literature to go away from our reality but it's funny because my book it talks about the worst reality ever, that it's to go to work. So, um, well, it's not the worst reality, but it's something that we don't want to find in a book because it's not something that you can dream about or that you can, um, you, you can escape reading this book about your own reality. So I remember when I was uh, starting to write about this, I wrote this book by Annie Arnaud's school, um, in, in Spanish, it says, Mira las luces, amor mío, and it's a book where she 
talks about her trips to the supermarkets. And I find it like so beautiful and so powerful. And she said like, it's weird that supermarkets are not in fiction because we spend a lot of time mm -hmm. in supermarkets and are not in the movies that much or in the books that much because it's something boring. So I have the same feeling about work. And I have a theory that it's because a lot of authors before they were rich or very privileged, they don't have to work to have a normal job, being like uh, blue collar or white collar or something. Um, so I don't know if in this case, my book helps you to escape from the reality or just like, it's like, Poniendo el dedo en la herida. Sim, sim. A expressão é exatamente igual em português. Pôr yeah. o dedo na ferida. Yeah. Uh -huh. Então, vamos falar justamente do... Bom, nada mais cotidiano do que o trabalho, não é? Uh, nada mais da vida de todos os dias do que o trabalho. O Desencanto, este, o, o teu livro, um, apresenta-nos na primeira pessoa Marisa, uma jovem publicitária de 30 e poucos anos que detesta o que faz, que até ocupa uma posição relativamente confortável na hierarquia do, do seu trabalho, mas que na mesma detesta o que faz. Uh, alguém que adiou uh, indefinidamente uma também indefinida ambição artística e que, e que passa muitas horas a ver vídeos do YouTube. Uh, sem querer forçar nenhuma relação biográfica, gostava de perceber até que ponto este livro uh, partiu de, de tua, da tua relação pessoal com o trabalho? Um, I don't know. The thing is, when I became... When I grew up and I was like 30, suddenly, around me, all of my friends were talking about work so much and not in a good way. They were all, or like, not getting... Not getting paid enough or with very bad conditions. So it was a conversation that it was in the atmosphere all the time. And I was wondering, two questions. First one, when did we get so boring as people, just complaining about one sim singular thing? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I feel like we were all a little bit desperate because we, it was like being a hamster in this wheel. And you didn't feel that you have a choice to get out of it. So I guess that the question is like the feeling, I had this feeling that Marisa had, but then everything is imagined. I never work in, in advertising, for example. Uh, and I'm not but that you, you know a lot about that uh, Yeah. Context. Well, there are some things that they were like pure fiction. I was like, I guess they <laughs> do a lot of coke, but I didn't know. And then I talked to people and they were like, yeah, we do a lot of coke. <laughs> so they were, <laughs> they were like some things that I was just uh, making it. But yeah, but about conversation and things that I hear about this world, uh, it just like was um, appealing to me to put the character there because it's a very fake and materialistic atmosphere, you know, they are all the time like trying to sell things that you don't need, like they are like creating desires uh, that you didn't know you have. So for me it was like perfect for the identity of Marisa to work in a place like that and being like ha having to be mean, even if she is not mean. Mm -hmm. Mas há uma coisa muito particular nela, ou seja, ela uh, tem consciência disso, que se sobrevoa como que está acima das suas circunstâncias, embora também seja um produto dela, delas, e vá na onda, não é? Mas era claro para ti que ela tinha de ter essa super consciência da sua posição na, na máquina. In the world, yeah, for me it was important. For me, um, there was this, this little... Um, essay that I read when I was writing the book, uh, and it was a theory about this, this sociologist American, that his name is Irving Goffman, and he was talking about how we are all the time performing. That we are, when, we, when you go outside of your house, you are basically faking it. You put a mask and you, if you were talking to your partner, you are more like yourself. But if you were talking to your family, probably you are always like the daughter of these parents. And if you were at work, you were probably faking a lot because who 
has like the worst thing of, of a person is never to be a perfectionist. But it's the first thing you say in a job interview. You are already lying about yourself. So um, I think I, I, I missed the question, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know what was going to say about it. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> so, oh yeah, so about the, the performance thing. It's, yeah. it's basically that he's all the time acting and, and one thing about this theory is that he said that only when we are at home, we are, we are uh, relaxed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering in this world, these theories about the, the 60s. So now with all the social media that you are like overperforming all the time, like where is the human being? So I was very worried about these problems of identity. Uh, in this world that you are like all the time performing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? I, yes, this is reminding me so much of this um, American car commercial that I've been seeing while my husband is watching Premier League soccer. And it is a commercial for Subaru, I think. And it shows a woman who it like time lapses her at her desk at work. And it's like gray and dark. And she's there like all hours just like banging her head against the thing. And then it's like you want to be a weekend warrior. And then she gets in her Subaru and she like goes and has this amazing weekend before she goes back to her horrible desk. And it was America just completely using capitalism to expand on that exact idea of like, you don't have to be this person, right? Like you don't have to um, make that your identity that you're sitting at your desk and you hate it. You can have 48 hours of yeah. your real self. I thought it was so funny. I've, I've been thinking about it's it. It's terrible, yeah. yeah. It's like compensation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel, o Notas, o livro que estamos a falar, o Notas sobre uma execução, um, começa por nos apresentar o Ansel Pecker, uma, um homem que está no corredor da morte a viver as últimas horas antes, antes da hora marcada. O livro é uma contagem decrescente dessas 12 últimas horas, 12 últimas horas do condenado. Depois a história leva-nos para outras vidas, mas em todo o caso, gostava de te perguntar por esta, por esta realidade específica e perceber se investigaste, ou como é que investigaste, o cotidiano de alguém que que aguarda no corredor da morte, porque é uma realidade uh, tão limite no, que, que nos é difícil chegar a ela, sobretudo porque não há, não há testemunhos na primeira pessoa não é, dessa experiência. Um, como é que te aproximaste desse, desse universo? Que é uma parte do livro, enfim, não é o livro... Não, é, não podemos dizer que é sobre isso, mas é uma parte importante do livro. Um, I, did, I did do a lot of research. So the prison... Um, in the book is a real prison. It's um, where, oh, I'm getting Portuguese. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a real prison where a third of the, the country's executions take place. So in the US, um, many of the states in the US still have capital punishment, but some have abolished it. And Texas is the state where this, uh, this book is set. And the prison I chose is where 33% of our executions take place. They're still happening there, um, I mean, not every day, but quite often. Um, and I knew I wanted to research this actual place and that it was important to portray as, as real of a, um, of a picture of the place that I could. But they don't really like to let novelists into prison for fun. Um, so I was not able to go in myself. I didn't really try. I kind of had the thought that, like, you know, if I try to go in, they're going to try to show me the best of it, right? They're going to try to show me um, how well the prisoners are treated, mm -hmm. if they even let me in at all. They will per perform. Right, exactly. They'll perform. And I didn't want that. Um, so what I did was actually I read a lot of blogs from inmates who lived in the prison while I was writing the book. Um, so some of them were live blogs. Like, uh, they were updating them every day. Some of them were sort of pleas for legal help. Um, and then I hired a research assistant who lived in Huntsville, Texas, or Houston, Texas, which is right near Huntsville where the prison is. And um, I found this research assistant by uh, getting some advice from a historical fiction writer friend of mine, which was really smart. I emailed all of the graduate programs in sociology 
near the area that I wanted. And I said, do you have any students who want to make a little extra cash for research? Um, and they sent me this lovely man named Dylan who was able to sort of pull the community. He found people who had been uh, correctional officers in this prison who were able to tell him things like what time the meals were served, each meal, um, sort of how the layout of the building looked. Um, he found the architectural blueprints of the building that I was able to say, okay, he lives on A pod or C pod or F pod or whatever it is. Um, what time they go for a shower, how many hours they have in the recreational yard. So all of those things mm -hmm. were as close as I could find to being real. Thanks to engaging someone who lived in that actual community. I don't think I would have been able to find that stuff myself. O que é que foi mais surpreendente? O que é que foi mais surpreendente nessa nessa investigação de perceber esse mundo tão particular que nos é vedado, não é? A quase todos. Yeah, I think the most surprising thing to me was how how bleak it really is. It really was an extremely dark place for human beings to live. Um, you know, they have to eat their breakfast at three o'clock in the morning. That's when it's served. Um, you know, and that's just a punishing way to have to live for, for it seems like a really, really arbitrary sort of punishment, right? To say, wake up at three o'clock in the morning, eat these cold eggs that were sometimes swarmed with ants. Um, like that kind of thing. Um, is just an extra way to punish them for a, whatever they're in there for, and they're already really being punished. Um, and this prison particularly was, uh, seems poorly run, and um, they didn't get, I think they get like one hour of recreation a day, which is very low. So um, this, this is a particularly punishing place for inmates to live. Mm -hmm. um, o Ansel Pecker, o, o, a personagem deste livro, um, é uma história que nos pode soar familiar né, pela quantidade de cultura popular sobre crime que já consumimos ao longo do tempo e falavas no início disso, não é? A quantidade de true crime que nos Estados Unidos, mas também aqui que consumimos. Um, tiveste um modelo óbvio para construir o Ansel Packer? Se tivesses de dar um conjunto de três ou quatro referências, quais é que seriam as mais importantes? Oh, um, Ted Bundy. You probably know who Ted Bundy is. Um, everybody in America knows who Ted Bundy is, and I think internationally he's pretty well known as well. He's probably the most famous American serial killer. When I was doing research for this book, I watched as many documentaries as I could on him, and I think there are like 12 or 13 recent documentaries on him. And one of the there, big... There's a film also. Yeah, there's a film also with Ted, uh, Ted Bundy, Zac Efron, um, who actually I thought was really good. I thought he was like really good, Ted Bundy. Um, So yes, Ted Bundy was a huge factor in this just because he is the person who's captivated the um, American eye for such a long time. That said, there are so many other men who have done similar things. Um, and I did a lot of research into all of them and I created the character of Ansel Packer by really just squishing them all down into one person. You know, he carries these traits that almost all American serial killers serial killers carry, which is, you know, he had a really hard childhood, he was abused as a child, he starts hurting animals, he has um, traumatic sexual experiences as a teenager, and then he begins to make the choices that he makes. And I really wanted to give him these sort of cliched tropes, because I felt that they're important to understanding why we hold these men up on pedestals, um, which is something I don't have the answer to. But I think giving him the tropes of the real people um, helped me dig into that character a lot. Um, Beatriz, de regresso ao, ao trabalho e ao mundo do trabalho, uh, tu, tu fazes no livro um certo uh, retrato de uma cultura empresarial uh, muito contaminada pelo discurso da, da, da autoajuda, do desenvolvimento pessoal, do sucesso, da superação, as mensagens motivacionais nas canecas de café, Uh, da empresa, os fins de semana de team building enfim uh, eu, olhando à volta enfim, para o mundo que nos acontece uh, tenho a impressão de que esse discurso, esse discurso da, da autoajuda é uma espécie de infecção que está de repente em todo o lado nas empresas, mas também na, na política uh, nas livrarias com secções muito grandes dedicadas a isso, no jornalismo talvez um, uh, sentes isto também? Achas que é uma das grandes Infecções do nosso tempo, esta coisa da autoajuda. Fuck yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there is something about the positive thinking that I'm totally against that because, it, or the magical thinking, I don't know how to say that it's, it's everything, it starts and ends with the individual. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you are not successful or if you don't have like, I don't know, enough money, love, friends, whatever, it's just your fault and you just have to smile and have a, take a good attitude and be nice and manifest and all of this thing. When the reality is like, it's not in your hand. What is in your hand, well, it's, sometimes it's nothing. The thing is like, because we can pay for therapy, we can go to, to a psychologist, or, and we have like these terrible jobs, very bad paid. We, the only solution is to buy a book and thinking that this book is going to help us to change our life. So yeah, I think it's kind of a pandemic. And I think, I was reading this article that was, um, really not inspiring, but, but made me think a lot. I think it was in the New Yorker and it was about therapy speak. And have you realized that we speak like if we were psychologically speaking, like we talk about trauma and like, yeah, this is my trauma and I have anxiety and I have like, and we are all the time like doing like this self-diagnose. Uh, constantly, and we said sometimes like, oh, I have, what is this, like, I don't know in English, apero, like distant, like in the relationships I have this distant, um, apero, I don't know the name. Um, and it's like, no, this guy is treating you, treating you badly. It's not that you have any problems that you need to psychologically resolve, but it's basically, I, I think it's a very individualist and capitalist uh, answer to a general problem. Uh, so yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it's a great idea of capitalism, no? This discourse of everything starts and ends in you. Uh, e, portanto, tu és responsável por, por tudo o que lhe acontece, não é? O bom e o mau. Uhum. Oh, yeah, that's the thing with, uh, with the recycling. Sim. Yeah, it looks like I, I'm the worst person in the world because I took a top Portugal flight to come here. And it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm totally, like, I, I, I like to do good things and I like to recycle and everything. But I remember when I come to work, there is uh, this, this post on the tube that it's like, you are wasting, I'm going to say that in Spanish, sorry. Estás, um, tu huella de carbono por venir al trabajo ha sido esta. And it's like, why are you blaming me? Blame my company because I have to go to work or I get fired. So it's like this constant guilt. I don't know if it's, if it's better or if it, Si se nos mete más en el cuerpo en los países que hemos sido católicos y tenemos esta mentalidad de la culpa que nos pueden señalar con absolutamente todo. Sorry for changing the language all the time. Um, so yeah, I think this, there is a whole industry of self-help, of making you feel guilty. Now I have to go green. So okay, so if I'm basically Jeff Bezos for getting the tube to go to war. Maybe I should buy a bike. So yeah, the end is like, capitalism has all these long tentacles. And at the end is like having everything. So that's my feeling, I don't know, but I know that I sound like paranoid or something. <laughs> it's like, I'm so upset with that topic. <laughs> Do you guys have uh, boundaries here? Like, I feel like the thing in the U.S. right now is, like, asserting your boundaries, right? And I've seen people do really mean, rude things and be like, look, I have such good boundaries. Yeah, the therapy is big. It's yeah, just, it's yeah. yeah, it's like boundaries. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you're just being an asshole and yeah. canceling last minute. Yeah, it's and like, it's oh, boundaries. I need, I, need, yeah. I, I need my own time and, I need, and I'm putting boundaries. And it's I don't like, have the please space don't. for this relationship yeah. right now. Yeah, therapy is big. <laughs> <laughs> Therapy speak yeah. basically allows you to be a horrible person mm -hmm. because you give amazing arguments yeah. and because it sounds like psychological, mm -hmm. scientific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aqui se calhar há um ponto curioso de, de contacto. Os livros são muito diferentes, não é? Como já dissemos, mas um ponto curioso de contacto, a questão da culpa 
Porque uh, o teu livro, uh, Dânia, apesar de, de falar desta figura do assassino em série, depois dá-nos uh, a, a visão e a perspectiva de três mulheres, sobretudo, cuja vida se cruza com a dele. Uh, de uma certa forma, há pouco, há pouco falavas disso, não é? Há uma certa ideia meio romantizada do, do assassino em série, meio desculpabilizadora. Uh, gostava de, de perceber como é que... Se é uma coisa que vem do princípio da escrita, essa coisa de dar, de, de oferecer estas três perspectivas femininas da história que começa por ser a do, do Ansel Packer, o assassino. Yes, I think so. The idea of guilt is really interesting to me because the serial killer at the very first page of the book is guilty. There's no question. He's guilty. He did it. Um, and the question is not, did he do it or did he not do it? It's what do we do with him, right? And the women in the book who surround him, who actually take up the majority of the book, I think they're like 85% of the pages are told from the women or something like that. Um, they feel they deal with guilt in their own way, right? And I think for um, characters like this in a story like this, the guilt often manifests in that question of what if, right? What if I had done this one thing differently? What if I had not gone to this place on this day? Would she still be alive, right? Would this horrible thing have not happened? Did I somehow cause this by some, you know, we, we tend to blame ourselves when terrible things happen. And I think the women deal with guilt in that way. And the way I wanted to bring it forward is um, the concept that, that sort of weaves its way throughout the book and really appears in the end of the book is the idea of the multiverse, right? The idea that um, out there, there's some version of the world where he has not killed these girls, or there's some version of the world where someone said something different that changed him and here's what would have happened instead, right? But what the characters have to contend with is the fact that even if there is a multiverse, we don't get to see it, we don't get to know it, we just have our one reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Beatriz, voltando um bocadinho atrás ali no, há pouco tocavas neste assunto, há uma coisa de que o livro fala uh, indiretamente, mas uh, uh, que é assim, a protagonista tem 32 anos, uh, perto disso hoje, presume-se um, e por isso ela faz parte de uma geração uh, e acho que vivemos isso de forma semelhante em Portugal e Espanha que atravessou uma crise num momento muito específico das suas vidas que foi aquele momento de chegar à idade adulta e ir para a universidade ou não, mas enfim, estar numa, numa, numa fase em que é suposto a vida parecer cheia de possibilidades e de, de sonhos. Uh, e essa altura coincidiu com a crise grande, começa em 2007, mas depois 2008 e por aí adiante, uh, que eu acho que foi uma, uma, uma terrível nuvem negra sobre os sonhos dessa geração específica, que hoje tem esses 30 e tal anos, uh, em que uma das coisas... Por exemplo, era uma das ideias que se calhar se colou é que ter trabalho, ou ter qualquer trabalho, já era uma coisa uh, maravilhosa, não é? Portanto, era melhor não, não nos queixarmos do que quer que fosse. Gostava de te de, 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 de perguntar se achas que esta relação meio doentia em alguns aspectos com o trabalho se vem daí também, dessa, desta circunstância específica, de nunca termos encontrado uma forma saudável de nos relacionarmos com o trabalho por essa circunstância termos atravessado essa, essa crise nesse momento tão, tão particular. Yeah, I think something changed after, because I don't know, for us millennials, it's, it's, it's not just the crisis, like the, the, the economic crisis, then it was the housing crisis, and then it was the, the the sanitary crisis, and so it was very, um, it was all the three of, 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 of them, and, and we suddenly realized that we are not going, like we are like, I was, I was talking with you about that, that in Spain and in, in, in Portugal, apparently we are the generation that we are living worse than our parents, mm -hmm. and I think this is kind of global. Uh, so this is really, really sad. And I think what changed is that we are not believing anymore the, the idea of the effort, this idea that you believe that if you uh -huh. were like the best, uh, the, the best kid in the school and you took the best grades and everything, you will have everything there now. 
we know that this sometimes doesn't happen. We were not rewarded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can not be rewarded. Maybe you are, but maybe not. Maybe you can put all of your effort and work a lot, and then some guy in Lehman Brothers does something, and you don't have that anymore, even if you put a lot of effort in it. So I think there is a crisis of, for that I was talking at the beginning about the future, like I don't know what's going on, and I don't know what uh, new generations are thinking, but there is this thing that it's a breakup between work and identity. One thing that I was very surprised in Spain about the book is that, I realized that at the beginning there were a lot of people like journalists and people in, in marketing and everything that they were writing to me like, oh, that was so my life, blah, blah, blah. But then I realized there were a lot of doctors and nurses and then some architects. And I realized that all of these jobs had in common that it's the dream job that you choose when you were a kid. It's more, it's a vocation. It's like you want to be a doctor, you want to be a journalist, and you became that, and you were so proud of that. But then, because everything was so fucked up, it's like you, you don't have the illusion for this job anymore, and you have to search and look for another identity. Probably when you arrived there and you, you were like, why I'm not happy. At the end, the book is, for me, is like trying to answer this question. Like, you are here at this point of your life, and you say, and that's, is this life? Is this everything? So. Uh, Daniel, do you, f do you feel the same way about yeah. this idea of crisis? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think you're right that we put so much when we're, when we're young, we put so much of our hopes and our dreams into work, the identity of work. Like, what are you, a, a thing you ask children all the time is what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And that's something yeah, that... Yeah, it's the first question. It's you the first like, question, What yeah. do you do? Right. What's your name and what do you do? So right. it's part of your identity all the yes, time. Yes, exactly. And the idea that that should make you happy I think is kind of toxic in itself, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I think there are certain voc vocations that people probably do feel that way about, but I think it comes from that space of being a child and being asked, what do you want to be instead of who, who do you want to be, right? Yeah. O tédio, Beatriz, o tédio, não sei se diz da mesma forma em espanhol, mas é criativo. O livro fala, eu leio muito, uh, ou seja, fala muito sobre isso também, o livro sobre o tédio e essa coisa de nos conseguirmos uh, aborrecer. Um, para ti é criativo o tédio? Yes, yes, I think we are, we are not bored anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think boredom is super important. I think we are all the time doing different stuff, we have a lot of noise around with, I don't know, with the screen time, like scrolling on Instagram or like listening to a podcast, like, like people just don't walk anymore. They have to be listening to a podcast or something or having something around. So I think boredom and having nothing to do is super important to creativity. It's like when you have your Eureka moment and where the ideas come. I think you need, it's very important research and reading and everything, but you need time to process all of this information. But I feel now we are so busy all the time. Um, busy with things that sometimes they are not that important. It's just you are doing another marathon of Netflix or you are, you are doing another uh, beauty routine that it's 25 minutes or something because it's Korean and you have to do these 12 steps. So um, I think we lose the capacity of being alone in a room and, you know, like, thinking about nothing uh, and I think we need to we need to claim this back somehow I don't know I don't know how without uh, no screen time or something like this but I think it's super important for creativity yeah you try to do that somehow? I try to I try to I try to know not what's like 
more than one episode, <laughs> you know? So maybe when I'm having dinner, I'm watching something, but then, then I'm trying to be. Uh -huh. And I have this, you know, this thing that told you, like, you have been 15 minutes on Instagram. So I have this kind of things. So, yeah, but it's like being a kid and you need someone to do, like, mm -hmm. don't do that, don't do that, because I, I, don't, I don't have... I don't have self-control. Dania, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a mesma coisa. O tédio é importante para ti e como é que se contorna esta a geração zapping, não é? Que somos de passar automaticamente de uma coisa para outra sem nos fixarmos em nada. Yeah, I think I completely agree with everything you just said. I think um, so. A writer once told me, fairly recently, actually, that after you after you sit down and have a writing session, you should take 15 minutes of just like total silence, and you can be doing something. So I often take those 15 minutes and I'll do the dishes, but I, you know, I'm not listening to anything. I'm not. I haven't, you know, called someone to say hi. I'm just like kind of exiting the writing space and the writing world, and those everything sort of sinks into you in those 15 minutes. And I think I've really taken that to heart and I, I try to do it kind of religiously now after I've been writing because I don't know if it's really boredom. Maybe it's just sort of like internal consciousness. And I think, I think internal consciousness is where I write from and it's probably the same thing as boredom in that it's not engaging with the outside world. O Notas sobre uma execução está... Vai haver uma série a partir do livro? In uh, <laughs> yes, possibly. It's okay. all very in flux right now. So it was going to be a TV show, and then it was going to be a movie, and now it's going to be a TV show again. But I can't say too much about it because I don't know too much about it. <laughs> okay. Mustache, uh, yeah, but irás... look out for it. But <laughs> irás acompanhar o processo, or vão ser outras pessoas a fazê-lo? Yes. Um, someone else will write it, but I will be an executive producer on it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. So someone else will write it. I'm not adapting it myself. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds too hard. I already wrote it. I don't need to write it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Beatriz, se o, teu, se, se o teu livro desse, como pode vir a dar, um filme ou uma série, quem é que escolhias para protagonista? Tens alguma ideia? Sorry, I... To choose a protagonist uh -huh. for a the, act, the, the actress. Oh, I don't know. And now it has to idea? be international. I don't. I don't have an idea. It's going to be a TV show. Oh, really? In Spain. So okay. I want soon or. Uh, I don't know. Maybe in two years or something. I don't know. I just sign it, but I can't say anything. <laughs> so I don't want to say a name of an actor. <laughs> just in case mm -hmm. I say something bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, okay. yeah. Better so, safe. <laughs> yeah, better safe. Mm -hmm. okay. Any Spanish actor between 30 and 35 will be amazing for the role. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Diplomatic, I like it. <laughs> ok, tentamos. Mm -hmm. um, vou perguntar se alguém quer... O sino está a avisar que falta um quarto de hora. Alguém quer fazer alguma pergunta, comentário um, sobre o que ouviram, sobre o que vos apetecer? Se quiserem, identifiquem-se e teremos um microfone. O livro da Beatriz, uh, possivelmente ainda ninguém leu, a não ser que tenham lido na versão original, porque saiu há, há mesmo muito pouco tempo, mas... <risos> ninguém, vou só dar mais um bocadinho, porque às vezes é difícil... Alguém se voluntariar? Não? Não? Ok. Então, quando continuar mais um bocadinho. Um, já que o tema que, desta conversa é cotidiano, eu gostava de vos, de vos lançar o, o, o desafio e o pedido de partilha que, que nos descrevessem o que é o vosso um dia ideal, o cotidiano ideal, desde que se levantam até que se deitam, o que é que é um bom dia? Dania. Do you mean like a good writing day or like a good life day or both? Life day. Whatever you want. Okay. 
Well, I've been, I've been doing this thing lately um, that I've really been enjoying, which is called, I'm calling it a full Friday. Um, and I've been like posting about it on Instagram because I have, I work a full-time day job. I'm a literary agent. But on Fridays, I try not to schedule any meetings and I make my schedule much more flexible. So in the mornings, I'll wake up and I answer my emails that immediately need to be answered. And then I kind of log off for the day of, you know, I'm kind of checking just in case. Um, but in the morning, I try to write for three hours to work on my book. Um, um, and then I go do some exercise, um, usually like some kind of like running or cardio of some kind that gets me like totally just washed clean, right? Um, and then I'll do my housework, like uh, I walk the dog, I do the dishes, I fold the laundry, whatever needs to be done. Um, and then I'll sit down for um, what, what I think is really the most magical period for me as a writer, which is the afternoon to evening. So um, when I take these full Friday nights, I go from like, 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and I just sit in my little office and I just sit with the book for that, those hours. And my husband cooks dinner. Um, and the rule is that on my very last hour, I get one glass of wine. <laughs> just one. More than one things get weird. But um, yeah, one glass of wine while I'm writing. And then I take the dog for a very late night walk and sort of wind down with some trashy TV and a dessert. And I find that that's been an excellent way to just really feel like I'm taking myself into the world of my book. So I think that's the ideal day in my life as a writer, and I try to do it on Fridays when I don't have visitors or I'm not traveling. Uh -huh. uh, o teu trabalho, o teu trabalho e a tua como agente literária e o teu trabalho como autora uh, contaminam-se. Uh, gostas do teu trabalho? Ele ajuda-te quando estás a escrever uh, de alguma maneira ou são coisas que mantens? Uh, de certa maneira, separadas. Yes, I love doing both. Um, I actually worked for a few years as a full-time writer without working in publishing. I went back to back to publishing because I, I missed it. And I, find, I, I think I'll do it, both of them forever. Um, people have asked, you know, if you get super famous, will you quit your agenting job? And I, I know. I think um, for me, it's really important to be engaging with other people's work. It's important to be needed in other ways for my ego that is not about my book. Um, like if things go horribly with my next book, I'll still be a valuable person person to myself in my career, I think. And I think that's like, you know, kind of tragic. But, um, but I like having my hands in multiple things. And I, and I love working with writers who I think have a similar aesthetic on the page that I do. So I, the, the two jobs definitely speak to each other. And I don't, I don't think I could do one without the other at this point. I think they need each other. Uh, Beatrice, your perfect day. Oh, my perfect day, that's easy. My perfect day is a day where I don't have any plans and obligations to do. That's, that's basically that. Uh, and I can do whatever I want that day. I can work out and I can have a coffee in the street, read a book, uh, maybe I will write later. I can pet some dogs in the street. That's basically a day with no, nothing to do. That's always perfect. E a mesma pergunta, o teu trabalho uh, como jornalista, uhum. como periodista, contamina a tua escrita de forma positiva? Uh, preferias um, não o fazer? No, <laughs> o I, think, I think it does not, because I, I write fiction. And for me, it's like two separate worlds. I don't know if one day I want to open the door of non-fiction, mm -hmm. but right now, because I have these like in a micro dose doing like these articles and just things I don't need it and I feel like I, even if it's writing I my feeling is that it's completely different and also I think I I, I was thinking a lot about the the fear of the white base the blank the blank page uh, the fear of the writer and because I have to write all the time, I think it actually helps uh, to this kind of, of, of fears because you just see a page and it's like, oh, I have to, you know, you, you know how to work with deadlines and you are not. So I, I, I guess like the journalist uh, work, it helps to be like more um, organized in, in the fiction literature world. Deadline is a very important word in the journalists. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and very scary. Uh -huh. <laughs> and necessary? 
What? But necessary? Yeah, yeah, it's better, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's better to have a deadline. Uh -huh. Even if it's just in your head, like I want to finish this by Friday, for example, mm -hmm. to have the day off, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, alguém quer fazer alguma pergunta? Reconsideraram? Ok, então acho que podemos ir passear para o sol. Obrigada uh, por, terem, por terem vindo. Uh, agradeço à Dânia Kukafka e à Beatriz Serrano. Um, obrigada por terem estado. Aproveitem a programação restante do fólio. E obrigada também, também a quem esteve a traduzir esta conversa. Em obrigada. Dias. Obrigada. Obrigada. Obrigada.